Happy Sabbath, everyone. Here we are again. That Sabbath comes as a constant reminder of who our Creator is, who our Redeemer is. Because on six days He created the world, but He rested that seventh day. And of course, Redemption Week, He did all things. Six days, He was crucified on that Friday and of course rested on the Sabbath, rose again the first day of the week on Sunday to give us the gift of salvation. And that's why we come together and worship our Lord, our God, and our Savior on this day, the Sabbath day. So again, we welcome everyone in our online community, and I hope we have a lot of guests. I know this week has, uh, has celebrated two birthdays, uh, July 4th uh, for our American brothers and sisters, and also July the 1st uh, for ourselves as Canadians. And you know what? This is not our home. Even though we celebrate those days, we're looking for an eternal home right? Eternal home, which Jesus Christ has carved out for us in heaven because of what he did upon the cross. And the laws that are governed in that kingdom have prospered with peace. And uh, it's just going to be a wonderful day when Jesus comes. Now, man can create laws and try to create laws down here. And, uh, you know, we're so good at breaking man's laws. And we can see a lot of upheaval, not only in south of our border, but also in Canada as well, right? We need the love of Jesus Christ. So I hope you're, you know, inviting your friends to come and worship with us on Sabbath here, to check out our services. We have special music. We have uh, praise teams coming. We have a children's story coming up. And, of course, our pastor, uh, Pastor Wetson DeVille, will give our a sermon. And uh, did I say the children's story? You can't miss the children's story. That is the most, one of the most important parts, the children's story, because we want to nourish our children in the Lord. Now we have some announcements, you know. We are continually being busy in our church, and so we have a bread ministry that happens every first and third a Sabbath, just outside here in our church. Uh, Gary Wessa, Julia, and uh, Maria, they're out there handing out the uh, bread, right? And so if you would like to come and get some of this bread, and the sole purpose, of course, is to give it to those that are in need. And so they're doing a tremendous ministry out there. So come by, say hello. It'll be today, all right? It'll be today between the hours of 3 and 5 o'clock. So you want to get involved in that ministry and uh, share the good news uh, by sharing a loaf of bread uh, with someone in need. We also have a meeting tomorrow, Sunday, July the 5th at 10 o'clock. It's an open uh, meeting for all the church. And because of what we see in today's world, we know it's, this is not the kingdom of God, right? Uh, the kingdom of God does not understand supremacy one over another as we have seen it with uh, social justice and the racism that we have seen on our news. And so we want to talk about this and how does the church uh, get involved? We want to discuss openly uh, the issues of racism and social justice in our community and in our society, and especially how our church um, uh, can respond uh, during this time. You know, our church back in the 1800s, uh, they were very much on the forefront uh, when it came to uh, bigotry and, and uh, racial issues. And so it's a good uh, historical lesson for us to learn. Uh, the church should never be Laodicean, right? We should always be at the forefront. And, uh, and how can we make change? I tell you, it's by sharing the love of God. Transform souls. John Newton, a, a horrific slave trader, when his life was transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ, he wrote the beautiful song, amazing grace. That's what the love of God uh, can do. And it can do it for you and it can do it for I. And that's how we promote uh, change in our society. So that's a meeting tomorrow, uh, Sunday at 10 o'clock. It will be a Zoom meeting and you will have gotten your uh, Zoom invite or at least go to the website and you'll see more details there. Also, we have VBS uh, sign up coming up on Monday, July the 6th. So again, 
check out the website. You want to sign up your kids. It's of course because of the restrictions placed upon us. We are going to be doing it through Zoom format, okay? So unfortunately for the parents, you're still going to have to supervise your children. I know Vacation Bible School was always a good time for the parents. We just drop off the kids and run away and, and, and do something on our own, right? But unfortunately, we're still going to have to uh, supervise our, our kids. But it's a good time for them to learn about Jesus, uh, learn about community, learn about being an influence in their society. So that's July the 6th. Uh, to July the 10th. So you want to look on our website uh, for that. And so coming up in our service today, we're going to have a video all about VBS. And so definitely you want to stay glued to your television set. And of course, we do have Bible studies going on Sabbath afternoon. You want to look at the website for the class that's running on, on today's lesson. And today will actually be Fundamental Beliefs, so you want to check that out. And every Tuesday, there's either a prayer line or a prayer meeting going on. So again, check out the website and uh, look at the details to become a part of that prayer. Prayer is the, the key in the Christian life. And so you want to look at that. So I just thank you uh, for tuning in today, and I hope you're going to be really blessed uh, with our entire program. We're looking forward to the future when we can start having some people in our congregation. The restrictions are 50 people, and we're looking at maybe in the maybe August, September, bringing some people in slowly. And because uh, I know I've talked with many of you on the phone, and you're really missing coming together uh, as a church family. So uh, we are we are thinking about that. The reason we're here today is to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, creator of all things in heaven and in earth, oh Lord, I just thank you so much for what you've done for us and how you died upon the cross for all of our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us your love, showing us your mercy, and showing us your grace. Your amazing grace, Lord, that transforms souls. That though I was wretched and evil and blind, that I can now be righteous in Christ, be good in, in the eyes of our Heavenly Father as He sees Jesus in me, and have my eyes open to the glories and kingdom of heaven. So, Lord, I give you all the praise and glory and honor, for besides you there is none else. And, Lord, I just pray that you watch over us and protecting us because we know we are in some troublesome times as we have brother against brother. And Lord, we need to understand how you have created us, your creativity in creating us so different. But yet on the inside, as Acts 17 has said, you have created us under one blood. We are one human race to you, but you've created us in such a different way. And that just glorifies your imagination. So Lord, I thank you for being our Father, and I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for being our Savior, and thank you for the Holy Spirit in guiding us into all truth. And now I ask for your blessing to be in our service today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so happy to see you today. I'm happy that we can spend time together worshiping God, even though we're in our own homes. So happy Sabbath to all of you. Today, I'm going to tell you about one of the very tiniest creatures that we have living around here. And I think all of you would have seen them. And if you go outside where you live and you're quiet and you listen, sometimes you'll hear a buzzing or a humming sound, and it's that creature making that sound because its wings are going so fast. So the creature I'm going to tell you about today is a hummingbird, and we have a very special kind of hummingbird called an Anna's hummingbird that lives here all year long. Even when you see snow outside, the Anna's hummingbird is still living and having to find food even in the cold weather. So that's the hummingbird I'm going to tell you about. And you can see I have something on my lap. I'm going to show you what I have in just a minute. But first, I want to give you a very special Bible verse. Because as you get bigger, you'll hear people say, there is no God. Sometimes people say things like that. 
We serve a mighty God. and God made everything. God has always been and always will be. So this Bible text was something that Paul said, and it comes from Romans 1, verse 20. And it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible, means hard to see, qualities, his eternal power and divine, meaning he's God, nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. All of us can know that there is a powerful, mighty God because of what we see. So today I have two special little hummingbird nests. And the very first one I have to show you, I'm gonna turn it like this so that hopefully you can see it from where you are. And maybe we'll put a photo up on the screen of it if we need to. Um, you can see there's moss on there. There's special leaves. If I turn it upside down, you can see there's a little um, stick that it's made on. There are little bits of like lichen and moss that you'd see on the tree. And inside, if you could see it, there are lots of little hairs. And um, it's, it's tiny. Um, you could see even beside my thumb just how small it is. So the hummingbird sits in there and they have about two eggs that they lay. So I'm gonna show you my, spe my second special hummingbird nest. I've gotta be careful with it because this hummingbird made it on some Christmas lights. So you can see one light sticking down the bottom here. And this one has an egg inside it. I'm gonna very carefully turn it to the side. It's a little white, tiny egg and it's smaller than a jelly bean. I have a jelly bean to show you in a second and it's smaller. And this one has all kinds of um, cozy feathers in there and it has cotton from a cottonwood tree. Um, and it has, I'll show you this plant here, when you go for walks and you see cattails. So this one's already shedding all of its fibers. People can make paper from this. Well, the hummingbird will use this to start a nest. It'll put some on a little branch and then it will add some leaves to it and some moss. And then it has a very special ingredient, spider's thread. So spiders are good architects and so are hummingbirds. And it will wrap the whole nest up in spider's um, web, the threads of it, so that it's really, um, it, nothing will destroy it. Even if the wind blows, it'll stay together because those are sticky. And then as the babies get bigger, they can push outward and the nest won't fall apart. And after the, the um, spider's web, then it will decorate it with moss and lichen. And it will even go up to a painted house or a fence and get a little chip of paint off and try and make it just look, um, they don't want the nest to look all the same. They like it to, to look like you're, you wouldn't notice it very easily. And hummingbirds will build these nests as low as a couple feet off the ground, all the way to maybe as tall as, if you were in this church, as tall as the ceiling. Um, and a hummingbird only weighs as much as two dimes. So I have two little dimes here. And every day they need to get as much food as half their body's weight. So um, they're amazing little creatures and God takes care of them every day, just like he takes care of you. Their heart beats 1260 times a minute. It would be like you having to eat 1,300 hamburgers a day, veggie hamburgers, I guess. But that's a lot of food. So um, maybe tell your parents to put up a feeder. Um, you can put a little bit of sugar, a quarter cup of sugar to one cup of water, and you can help the hummingbirds because they have to eat all the time. So flowers aren't quite enough. Um, so I hope that just knowing how God cares for our tiny creatures will help you know that he's going to take really good care of you as well. You don't have to be worried. And remember, if somebody says God didn't make the world, you remember the hummingbird who's so incredible. Have a good Sabbath, everyone.
Are you ready for Vacation Bible School? We are, and it's coming right to your home. Kids love heroes, and this summer, instead of talking about the superheroes from the movies, we will learn about Bible heroes. Miriam, Samuel, and Rhoda were all kids that did little things that made a big difference. Each day, we'll talk about different characteristics of real heroes and how Jesus is with us and will help us be heroes by doing little things that will make a big difference. Kids will learn to be brave for Jesus, be devoted to Jesus, be caring to others, be bold in sharing, and be generous to others. The entire program will be available for you to do while you are safe at home. Begin each day at Bethany, where kids sing great songs. Learn the daily action point. Be generous. Jesus is with me. And Bible verse. And the Bible hero for the day is introduced. Then we head on out to explore the town. At Discovery House, they will hear the Bible story told by our great team of puppeteers. Next, it's off to the arena where we will learn about a different animal each day. A favorite stop is always the Oasis Prayer Station where kids will learn how much Jesus loves them, do an activity, and spend time in prayer. Your kids will love the fun and interactive learning at our Heroes Home Edition Vacation Bible School. Don't miss it. Sign up today. Sabbath. I'm glad that all of you can join us today. Even though we are at home, I'm so glad that we can praise God wherever we are. And one thing to keep in mind is that when humans' words fall apart, we can always stand on the word of God, and the word of God is a promise to us. So let us sing, standing on the promises, uh, number 518. Let's joyfully sing and remember the promise of God to us.
our next song is in moments like these let us sing together much for singing with us. Please enjoy the rest of the service. the 
promised homeland they've looked for so long. The strangers and pilgrims are no longer strangers. The tired, weary wanderers wander no more. The Celebration, the welcome home banner flies over the door. These are they who have come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes in. Everything that is going on, and looking back at the numbers that we have seen in the past, we are wondering, we are asking, what happened to the loved ones that we lost? What happened to those that we are playing with, we are fellowshipping with? What happened to a loved one that are no more? What happened to a person when they die? Some believe uh, either you go to heaven or paradise or to go to or you go to hell. Almost hell is a furry and horrible place. Some believe there are several levels of existence and a series of heavens and a series of hells that you go through. Some even believe that you might be reincarnated and become a plant or animal or become something else. Believing in reincarnation and nirvana, those who attain nirvana become part of the cosmos. Some religions believe the soul travels to distant places and the soul of the dead enter an invisible spirit world. Some Christian even believe that all go to heaven or all go to hell. And you have a few that do believe that some sleep in the grave until the resurrection day. How can we know? How can we be sure about that? Let us pray. Father in heaven, there's one thing that is inevitable is that as we are born, each and everyone will face death. But as we know, as we go through life, you promise us you will be with us till the end of days. So Lord, as we will discuss about this mystery or this death, may that you comfort our heart, not only for ourselves, but for those who we already say goodbye to. Oh Lord, remind us that your love will sir are born and even in our pain and our suffering and our sorrow. So I pray as we are going through your Bible that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, that we can see Christ and your mercy and your grace. Oh Lord, do much more than I can ask. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Death is an unwelcome, unwanted, and a depressing fact of life. No sooner are we born than we begin to die. Whether we like it or not, sooner or later, death is an uninvited, unwanted guest that inevitably knocks at everyone's door. But where does man go at death? If anywhere, isn't it a little frightening to take a journey without knowing where you're going, without knowing the destination, without knowing what may or may not be, or whether you will come back alive or not? And we word Beecher said, now come the mystery as he was about to die. Socrates said, farewell, I go to the way of all flesh, but whether to life or oblivion, I know not. There's the story in Richmond, Virginia, on a tombstone, and it reads, stop, my friend, as you go by, as you are now, so once I was. As I am now, you soon shall be. So prepare yourself to follow me. Oh, if you read this, I'm sure you will not be happy with the tombstone. But there's one uh, young boy uh, walking by and reading what he, the inscription, inscription decided to add a few words, a few lines of his own. He scratches those words. To follow you, I'm not content until I know just where you went. You have to understand, we want to make sure what is the final destination? Where are we heading? What happened when we die? The question right now is, where are our beloved one that we lost? Where are our beloved one? Where are they? Because the pain sometimes is unbearable. Where does a man go when he dies? Heaven? Hell, purgatory, oblivion. Is there really a great mystery, a great new adventure, or just a handless silence? Where are you planning to go, if I can ask jokingly? Are our goodbyes the final act? Or is death just a pause between two eternities? Where are, those, where are our beloved? Centuries ago, Job asked the question that everyone, including myself, uh, have asked once in her life. Job 14 verse 14 says, If a man dies, shall he live again? Because the reality is we all want to be reunited. We cannot hold or we cannot accept the separation. Isn't that the most important question to be answered about death? Let us turn to our only deep, dependable source of information. The Bible gives us answers. The Bible's teaching on death is consistent, not confusing. Not as some might say, we don't fully know, but the Bible is clear. There may be some surprises for you. But its answer are both reasonable and satisfying, and best of all, it's comforting. Isaiah 26, verse 19, we read, Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise, and the earth shall cast out the death. Yes, there is life beyond death. Our beloved dead will live again. It's almost saying, after life, there is life. At the moment of death, or some time later, that's the question we will want to know. When is that new beginning? When is that new life? What happens when a man dies? One of the most quoted passages of Scripture concerning the death is found in Ecclesiastes 12, which describes what happened to a man when he dies. 
I'm sure if you have attended a funeral, you probably have heard it. If you have been to a gravesite, you probably have heard it. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 said this, Then the dust will return to earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. In other words, when man dies, his body, made up of the elements of the earth, returns to dust, and his spirit returns to God. Of course, to fully understand what the spirit is, we need to look at creation and discover how God made man in the beginning. Genesis 2, 7 said, And the Lord God formed man on, of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. Adam was ready to live. Adam was formed completely. He was ready to live, but he was, was not living until God breathed into his nostril. The bread of life gave Adam, and Adam was able to become a living soul. Oh, Job 27, said, 27 verse 3 says, As long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God and my nostril, technically and assuredly, you will still be alive. Because the spirit of breath uh, is what keep our body alive. As you remember, as we, we count creation, God formed Adam, but Adam was not alive until he received, like some say, the superior from God and received the breath of life. He became a living soul. James 2 verse 26 make that statement. The body without the spirit is dead. And he was right because as we have learned, dust plus spirit of the breath of God equal a living soul. Then what happens at death? What happened to those who die? Just the reverse or the opposite. If you take away the spirit of the breath of God, that dust become a lifeless corpse. Thus man is spirit, thus man is breath of, breath of life equal a corpse. We can best understand this, uh, this truth by the following illustration. I'm sure each and every one of us have already changed at one point of our life uh, a light bulb. As you take that bulb out of the box, uh, that bulb, bulb is lifeless until you screw it, until you connect it to the electricity and you turn on uh, the electricity, you turn on the interpreter and there is light. We get light. No one puts the light in the bulb. The bulb, the lights comes on by uniting the two components, bulb plus electricity. When you disconnect it, when you take it out, uh, when you stop the electricity, the light goes out. Just so at death. When the breath of life, uh, the spirit come out, the person become a corpse. Psalm 146, 3 and 4 tell us, do not put your trust in princes or in a son of men in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, earth and that very day his plans perish. But where? Where do the dead spend their time between death and their resurrection? Job tell us, when all your plans are perishing, when there's no more, where do you go? Job 17, 13 said, I wait for the grave as my house. According to the Bible, when a man dies, he does not go to heaven. 
According to this word, there he does not go. He does not go to hell. He does not go to the purgatory. He doesn't get reincarnated. He doesn't get transformed into a plant or animal. In fact, he does not leave at all, anywhere. Death is a cessation of life until the resurrection, until the return of Christ, until when the body reunited with the breath of God. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 remind us, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Evidently, the dead do not even know what is going on. The dead uh, don't know what you who are alive is doing. What you who are alive is thinking. They don't know anything. For the Bible says that of the man who has died, it is asleep. Job 14 put it this way, verse 21. His sons come to honor and he does not know it. They are brought low and he does not perceive it. The loved one, unfortunately, that you have lost, as you visited his gravesite, uh, he doesn't know or she doesn't know anything. I know the pain is real. I know the pain is there. I know the suffering sometimes is unbearable, but the reality, they don't know anything. You see, the one of the most comforting truth in God's word is that when a loved one dies, they rest quietly, undisturbed by the problems of life until the call of the life giver. It is, it is any wonder that the Bible likens death to as a sleep. In fact, Jesus himself said that death is a sleep. While he was talking to his disciple in John 11, 11, he made that statement responding to the inquiries of, of his disciple and wanted to go and meet his friend Lazarus. Christ said this, A friend Lazarus sleeps, sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. The disciples were confused, and if you were there at that time, you were confused because in your mind, you knew full well Lazarus was dead. They knew. They came to ask God for help when he was healed, and some time passed, and it's as if Lazarus was on his dead bed, and they call out to God, come visit him one last time and Christ continued to do his ministry until some days later and decided to go and see his friend because his friend was asleep. The disciple perplexed uh, wonder what Christ is trying to say. John 11, 12, 14 said, as the disciple were thinking that, oh, if he is well, if we're going to go wake him up, that means he will get well. That means he probably didn't die. But Christ was speaking, was speaking about his death. Then he, the verse continued to say, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. As Jesus and the disciple make their way to Bethany, Martha, the sister of Lazarus, rushed out to meet Christ and cried to him. You have to understand the pain was real, or the struggle or, or the suffering. It was so real that she was happy to see Christ. As she come at his feet, uh, uh, still in John 11, 20, verse 21, she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother will not have died. She knew for sure when Christ is present, if Christ was there, there will be no harm coming their ways. That's why we can rest assured we are safe and secure in God's harm. No doubt she was right. Confidently, I agree with Martha. But Christ answers something different. 
Christ answered and said, your brother will rise again. Now, notice carefully Mar Martha's response. Martha knew her Bible. Martha probably sat down at Jesus' feet as often as she could and listened to his word and took his word to heart. And she said, I know. I am confident. I rest assured, even though you see my tears, I know and I believe your word because you said he will rise again in the resurrection of the last days. Oh, Martha was so close. Martha listened. Martha obeyed. Martha knew the words of Christ and the promise that he made that even though we die, he will give us life. Even though our loved one are no more with, with us, one day in the resurrection morning, at the last day, at his second coming, every eyes will see him again. Martha knew. She had often listened to Christ, to his teaching. She spent time, in a way, if I can exaggerate, and she spent time like us reading his word in order to know him and that he may know us as well. That's why John 5, verse 28 and 29 said this. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Jesus had been speaking about his second coming. Jesus has been making sure that we have a solid foundation and reminded us the hope and the promise that is found in him and him only. And Martha rest assured that she knew Jesus will resurrect his son, his brother, at the end of the world. However, Jesus was about to do something dramatic. Jesus was about to give a, 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 a new hope. Jesus was about to strengthen Martha's faith and strengthen everyone that was there at Lazarus' house and especially us today. I love Christ. Christ don't do things, don't do small things only. Christ do things that we are baffled by. Christ do things that miracles, Christ do miracles that open our eyes and our mouth is dropped and say, wow. Christ, the life giver, the life saver, want to do this for you as well. What did he do, you might ask? Jesus cried out in a loud voice, the Bible tells us, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out. Or oh, someone has said, uh, luckily, I praise God that he only said Lazarus because if he didn't specify, if he didn't see, say any names, all the tombs will be empty. I don't want to believe that because I believe in the power of my creator. I believe in the power of my Christ. I believe in the power of my redeemer. And I believe in the promise that he is the great I am. It is interesting that Lazarus died and was buried for four, ye four days. He didn't Call talk about his death experience. He didn't explain that he went to heaven. He didn't explain that he went to hell. There is no record of what happened to Lazarus. Because the Bible already tells us when you die, you know nothing. But today's a bookstore or online book, uh, I books, uh, uh, our, our kingdoms are filled with people that had near death experiences. They went to heaven, they went to hell, they went to so many places. You wonder how come 
when you compare them to Lazarus, how come Lazarus didn't talk about all this? Because the reality is, when you died, you know nothing. There is, this is one wake-up call. I have to be honest. Most of us snooze our alarm clock. But this one call, this one wake-up call, you don't want to miss it. I can guarantee you, this is the call that Job anticipated and he should as well. And we should as well because in Job 29, 11, 29 said this, you shall call and I will answer you. Christ called out to Lazarus. Lazarus stood. I don't know if he hopped. I don't know if he walked. But I know he was glad that he was able to hear Christ's voice. I know he was glad to be able to be reunited with his loved one. I know he was glad to have life after death. What a wonderful hope that we have as Christian to be able to see life beyond the grave, to be able to pause and calm ourselves and reflect on the promises of Christ and to know that the tomb, to know that the grave is not the end. I know it might not always be easy. I know it is sometimes demanding to trust. But the reality is we have a firm foundation that those who die in Christ, those who gave their life to our Savior, will receive life. They will hear their name called out in that resurrection morning. And I want you to be present as well as they will be present. Well, I want to say thank you to our life giver, God. Thank you to our life saver, Jesus Christ. Thank you to the comforter, the Holy Spirit, that we can say to our loved ones, we will do not, we will not have to say goodbyes forever. We will not have to say, I will always miss them because we know there will be a day. We know we will meet again. We know that we will be reunited. We know this is just for a while. Isn't this one of the greatest news? At least for me, it is. To know in my, Christian, in my Christianity, Christ gave me a hope that no one else can take away from me. I might cry. I might be sorrowful here and there. But I can still rejoice and be glad that this is not the end. While you are crying, while you are missing your loved one, Paul shared with the early Christian church, these comforting words found in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Lest, your sorrow, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. We have a real hope in Christ. Her hope is found and is firm in Christ. So by Christ's death on the cross, his burial in the tomb, and his glorious resurrection, he gained victory for you and I and for those who have loved, or for those who we have lost. Death itself cannot rejoice. Death itself cannot celebrate. Death itself cannot say that he is the winner because at the end, when Christ will return, we will rejoice. I know I am victorious because my faith is found in Christ. The same way Christ proclaimed triumphantly in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me Though he may die, he shall live. And I say amen and praise God for that. Oh, as we grow older and as we lost loved one, 
And as we lost friends, uh, sometimes it is hard to smell. Sometimes it is difficult to go through our days. Uh, but let me remind you, for those who believe in him, he remind us, he affirm that he is the resurrection and the life. Uh, those who are found in him will not die, but they will have life and life abundantly. Yes. The resurrection of Christ followers is as certain as the resurrection of Christ himself. As Christ was resurrected, we will be resurrected. Oh, uh, when, someone might ask, when will this occasion, when will this happy, when will this celebration, when will this take place? When will God's sleeping children will live again? I'm glad you asked. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, starting from verse 20, said this, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has, come the, has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Christ the first fruits afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Yes, the answer is clear. At Christ's second coming, later in the same passage, Paul declare, as we see, as we rejoice in Christ's resurrection, we can rest assured our resurrection is as well. Verse 51, 52 said this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment. And the twinkle of an eye uh, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Verse 53 says this, For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Not only Christ give us life, not only Christ uh, restore us, not only Christ uh, give us another opportunity to live for eternity with him, he give us, he will give us a new body. He will make all the old things pass. He will create a new creature. He will change a body that we may be ready to go to heaven. Oh, Philippians 3, 20 and 21 said this, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Uh, David said it best, uh, and David was satisfied knowing that God was about to wake him up. David was just happy to be able to be awake on that day. But I was more happy the way David put it. Psalm 17, 15 said this, I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Would you not be glad? Not only you will receive a new body, but Christ will awake you and you will be in his likeness. Oh, I don't know if I will be 10 feet or 12 feet or 15 feet tall. I don't know, but one thing I know for sure, I will be truly like my Savior. First Thessalonians 4, 15, starting from verse 15, said this, For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, and remain until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of our archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them and the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. What a glorious hope. What a beautiful hope that we have. 
what assurance that we have. I don't know for you, I will definitely not snooze that great alarm clock with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet. I will call present because I want to be reunited with my loved one. You have to understand, all of us have lost someone that are dear to us. All of us have lost a relationship that we still linger and we still want to reestablish. All of us know the pain and the suffering. We might experience it differently, but we all know what it feels like. For some, it is a husband. For some, it is a wife. For some, sadly, it might be a mother or father or worse, a child. Whatever the case may be, today I want you to know Christ gave you that promise. Give us that assurance. Give us that blessed hope that you will meet him again. Oh, the only requirement is to accept his free gift. The only requirement is to take that promise and make it yours. God's promise of eternal life is clear. Christ has paid, has made the payment. Christ has made it possible. He had paid it on the cross and the empty tomb is proof of it. How can we be certain today that we can have victory over death? 1 John 5, 12 give, tell us this. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Oh, I hope this promise may wipe away all your tears. It has done it for me. I have lost a loved one, but I'm still rejoicing because now I know. Now I can stand on the firm foundation because those who have uh, the Son has life. I pray today you make sure that you have the Son as well. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Sometimes we prefer to believe things that are out of the ordinary. Things that make us use our imagination to feel good about ourselves. But the reality is simpler than that. That those who are dead, those who, are, who passed away or are asleep, I praise you, Lord, that they don't know nothing. Because I'm sure they would suffer again with us as they see how we go through life. I praise you, Lord, that you have set a time at the end of days when your son will return with the sound of the trumpet, the sound of the archangel. You will call those who die in you and you will call them to come out of the tomb, to come out of the grave. Oh, Lord, may that each and everyone will be part of that resurrection. May that we rejoice in you because we know that blessed hope is truthful and we can bring it to the bank. Oh Lord, may that we have the Son, Jesus Christ, because only in him life is found. As you are the life giver, as he is the life saver, and as the Holy Spirit is the comforter of our heart, we pray that we will stay faithful. Till the end. Until then, Lord, protect, keep us, and continue to walk with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.